الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ومغفرته. So brothers and sisters, please may I request that you click the subscribe button before we continue. Um, obviously yesterday everyone knows what happened. Uh, David Cameron and the Parliament in general they voted in favour of bombing in Syria. Uh, the reason why this is a problem is not necessarily like as if to say we want ISIS to live or survive. But our problem is that innocent people are going to die. Innocent civilians are going to be harmed along the way. In Islam, our position on harming innocent lives is that it's impermissible. We're not even allowed to harm trees, let alone an innocent human being. But in the nature of the way warfare works nowadays, you take a bomb, you drop it somewhere, people around and about that area, they're also going to die as well. They coined a term for this, they called it collateral damage. Collateral damage is when there's innocent people who are not involved, a young boy, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, who may have ambitions of being something big one day, but that person's gonna die and he's just gonna be seen as collateral damage. That's a term that they coined. In the Iraq war, collateral damage was 123,000 innocent civilians, 123,000 innocent individuals. And to be fair, the problem that the world is facing with regards to ISIS today is a direct result of the Iraq war. If you look at them, they came, this group, it came as a direct result of the consequences that the people in Iraq faced after the Iraq war. And it came as a, as a response to the collateral damage and the, uh, the, the foreign forces inside of their country. And David Cameron affirmed this. Because on the 15th of October, what did he mention? He said, Russia's bombing of Syria is only going to increase in the radicalization. And there's actually academic research that they have to back this up. Professor Robert Pape from the University of Illinois in Chicago, who was funded by De um, George W. Bush's government, funded by his government to do a research on what it is that causes terrorism, specifically suicide terrorism, at the end of his research, he came to the conclusion it's got nothing to do with Islam. It's got everything to do with social, political and economic tensions and complications in the regions that these incidents take place. And if they happen in lands outside of them, it's because those lands are directly connected to those political, social and economic tensions. I mean, this issue that happened in Paris is enough for us to see that it's got nothing to do with Islam. The individuals who were involved, who were caught after, they didn't have Islamic lifestyles. I mean, the guy, before he does the attack, which he's apparently doing in the name of this religion, and he's got nothing to do with this religion, what he's done. But what's he doing? He's in the bar drinking, smoking. The girl, she was known to not have a religious character in the slightest. And then for you guys to come and make accusations of people to say that these people are doing it in the name of Islam. And it's got nothing to do with Islam. It's because of social political reasons, so on and so forth. And it reminds me of an ayah in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ That Allah says, when you look at these people, they say to you, don't cause corruption on the land. Don't be terrorists. Don't do terrorism. Don't kill innocent people. Don't be people who create problems for other people. And they say, we're peacemakers. We're reformers. We are people of reform. We are here to solve problems. We're going to reconcile. We're going to correct problems in the Middle East and the rest of the world. We're going to make peace. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, rather, and we take what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says because He knows what's in the hearts of these people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala innahum humul mufsidun wa la yash'urun. Allah says, rather, you people are the terrorists. Rather, you're the corruptors. You people are the people who create corruption on the land, but you can't perceive it. You're that deluded that you actually don't realize that you are the ones who are creating the problems in the land. Now, with that said, I can bang on talking about this. And that's what a lot of people are going to talk about. Oh, the double standards of the West. Oh, look, uh, people in Paris died. It was wrong. They were innocently uh, They were innocent. They were killed. But now they're going to do what? They're going to kill hundreds in return. And we can bang on about those double standards, but really and truly, brothers and sisters, we're like, how long have we banged on about these things? Has it ever made a difference? Rather, will it make a difference? No. Because there is a solution 
to the suffering of the Muslims and the world in general right before our very own eyes, but we choose to turn away from it. And the more we choose to turn away from it, the more the problems that we're facing are going to continuously pile up and increase on us. Let me remind you of a hadith that you all have heard. And if you haven't, then hear it now. And if you've heard it previously, react to it as if it's the first time that you've heard it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us exactly of the affair that we're going to see today. The messenger, when he was talking to his companions, he said, a time will come when nations will gather up around you. Nations will gang up on you. Several countries and nations and regimes and armies, they will surround you Muslims. They will surround you the same way a group of people surround a single place, plate of food. Now imagine you've got a whole bunch of hungry people in a room. But you have just one plate of food in the middle with just one chicken leg or something. How are all of those people going to treat that plate of food? They're going to annihilate it. They're going to devour it. And the messenger said, that is how the nations will gang up on you. The companions were smart, smart people. So they would ask questions. They said, Ya Rasulullah, is this going to be because we will be small in number so that we are overcome by the sheer number of these other forces? And the messenger said, no, pay attention Muslims. He said, no, rather you will be massive in number. You will be humongous in number. How many Muslims are alive today? 1.8 billion. 1.8 billion Muslims, my brothers and sisters. Are we not massive in number? Are we, but, and do we not have all of these nations surrounding us? Like innocent Muslims, the innocent Muslims in Syria. I've got about 20 different countries dropping bombs on them. The innocent little kids walking in the street. Is this not what the hadith is talking about? Don't go too far. Go back to Hajj. Hajj, just two months ago, a month and a half ago. How do people come to Mecca in Hajj? You have about 2 million odd people there. In those 10 days, you've got about 2 million people in that one city. They all come together for one purpose. To unite upon the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've got too many people in that one location, just literally a stone throw away. You have Jerusalem, Masjid Al-Aqsa, the Kaaba, Masjid Al-Haram, Masjid Nabwi, the Prophet's Masjid, then the third most holiest place for us, which is Masjid Al-Aqsa. In those 10 days, whilst you've got 2 million Muslims just around the corner, the Israeli Zionist forces enter into the Masjid and they shoot up and they spray worshippers in the Masjid. That used to be a qibla for us, you know that, right? The Prophet ﷺ, he never used to initially pray towards the Kaaba, he used to pray towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. They came in, soldiers, guns, and they sprayed up innocent people. You got two million Muslims round the corner, they united upon what? Upon what are they united? Apparently, Allah's worship, right? As I'm going to explain to you later, the problem is that they're not even united. But look, they couldn't do nothing. They have no weight. They, they couldn't have a voice. No, nothing, they can't do nothing, nothing to help the Muslims who are suffering and innocently being shot up there. What does that show you, brothers and sisters? We're living in the times that the Prophet is talking about in his hadith, so pay attention! Because the Prophet is going to continue, and he's going to tell us why and the solution to this. The Sahaba asked, Ya Rasulullah, why is this happening? How is it that we're going to be in larger number and we're going to be taken over? And the Prophet said, because Allah will place al wahan in your hearts. What is Al Wahan, they asked, and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, Wahan is you love this dunya. You have fallen in love with this dunya and you have hatred for the next life. You hate death. Brothers and sisters, why is it that a person would hate the next life? Because a person never, you would hate to go somewhere that you've not invested in. You would hate to go to a place that you have not prepared anything for that place. Matter of fact, you destroyed it. You bankrupt your next life because your love for this life was so strong that you fell into disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you fell into turning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disobeying every single thing for the women that you love, so you fornicated with them. You had love, the women are they not from the dunya? You loved, so you fornicated. You engaged in haram. You were masturbating, watching pornography. You were doing all these things because of your love for this dunya. You were making haram money, whether it be from the drugs, from fraud, doing your scams, you are um, engaging in riba, university loans, mortgages. Your love for this world caused you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything to the extent where then you began to hate the next life. And of course you would hate a place 
where you know that you've made yourself bankrupt. You've not prepared anything for yourself. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in Surah Maryam, وَاتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ آلِهَا تَلْيَكُونُ لَهُمْ عِزَّةً كَلَّا سَيَكْفُرُونَ بِعِبَادَتِهِمْ لِيَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ ضِدَّةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said these people, they look for honor in other than Allah. Izza, they took besides Allah other gods. Why? Because they wanted honor, they wanted the izza and respect from other things. Is that not what the girl does when she finds herself a guy? She th this guy is going to, like when she goes for a guy that all the other girls want, this is going to be a, this is going to be a guy who's going to give her some respect. Does the guy not do that when he goes for a, a, a girl, she looks buff, she's nice, she's, she, 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 she looks appealing to the eye and all the other guys like her, but then he pulls her? It's izza for him, is it not? Yeah fam, you see the girl that I got? The chick that I pulled last night? You see the way that I'm moving? You look for respect in everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The clothes and the garments that you buy and the haram that you do in order to get those things. The mortgage that you took to buy that house so people can come and say, wow, look at this house, mashallah. You're looking for respect and izzah in everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes to the extent that when you're looking for respect and honor in things other than Allah, you fall into shirk. Some people go to their graves and they literally worship the people dead in the graves. And they pray to them to ask them to help. They go and they beg the Prophet ﷺ. When he himself, when he himself couldn't do, he used to say, I, he, he used to himself pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah tells in the Quran that if he couldn't ward away harm from him, him own self, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet you go to him and you pray to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he already told us, don't do with me what the Christians did with Jesus, what they did with Isa alayhi salam. And then the, and the shirk and then whatnot, it continues. But we look for respect in these things. And Allah says on the day of judgment, The things in which we look for res respect will reject us and disbelieve in us and deny us on the day of judgment. These very, the, the very girl that you're running after, the very degree that you're running after, the very business that you're running after, all these people in their graves that you're running after, on the day of judgment, they're going to turn their back on you. They're not going to be there to support you. They're not, I told you in the previous video that I released that Isa alayhi salam on a day of judgment is going to say Ya Allah, la as'aluku al-yawma illa nafsi I don't ask you for help for anyone today except for myself La as'aluku, I don't even ask you for who? Maryam, walidatni, the one who gave birth to me Isa who's a prophet of Allah is going to say on a day of judgment that I, and Ibn Kathir brings this uh, You go to the previous ayah, bring the references and everything But he's not, he's not even, on that day he's going to be so scared for himself He's not even going to ask about his mum and he was made obedient to his mom as we know in Surah Maryam. And there you are running after these things in this life as if to say they're going to help you in this life. Wallahi you lost this life and you lost the next. You lost this one and you lost the next. Brothers and sisters, so the problem that the Muslims are suffering is that we love this world. We love it too much. As if to say the certainty of death won't see us one day. And we're not prepared anything for it. And that causes us to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, Wallahi there's a solution for us. And I'm going to present this solution to you, inshallah. Are you going to take it? Wallahi, all of you there who are hashtagging, tweeting, putting up videos and pictures on Instagram and sharing videos on Facebook and showing your outrage, all of you people who are petitioning and protesting, those of you worshippers who are praying, what everything, anyone who feels hurt, hurt like, like pain about this, are you going to take action as per the correct solution? Because if not then, Shut the video off now because Wallah is going to be a proof against you on the day of judgment. For you know a way to get out of it. And I'm going to give you evidence, not coming from me. But give you the way out of it inshallah. From the Quran and the Sunnah with evidences. But turn the video off now if you're not going to implement it. For Wallah is going to be a proof against you on the day of judgment. Brothers and sisters, Wallah, the solution is four steps. They're very simple. Wallah, very simple. The first thing is return back to the Quran. The second thing is to return back to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ told us that if you start to do riba, ayna, which is a type of riba, haram, if you make money in a haram way, university loans, mortgages, all these things, and you grab the tail of the cow, meaning you follow the dunya wherever it takes you, and you become pleased with this world, and you leave off striving in the cause of Allah, primarily what? Striving against your own self. The evils in your own self primarily. If you leave off these things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do what? He will humiliate you. Hatta tarju'u ila deenikum. Until you come back to your religion. 
until you come back to your religion. Brothers and sisters, the Quran and the Sunnah is our religion. Listen, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his final khutbah on Hajj, this is the biggest gathering that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever saw in his life. Not only that, it's the last time he'll ever see a gathering like this because he knows he's going to die. He said at the beginning, I may not be here with you next year. When a person is going to die, and that person is the messenger of Allah, who's been tasked with the most important task, is he not going to say in his last sermon to the largest crowd, the most important things? Is he not going to leave them behind with the most important information? He is. And what did the Prophet say? He said, I left you upon. I have left you upon what? I have left you upon clarity. He said the clarity in terms of what he's taught us, his teachings are clear. And he said it's so clear that it's darkness, it's night time is like day. Imagine at night time you're walking around but the sun is out. The prophet is trying to say the clarity I've left you upon is that it's night is like it's day. Even it's night is clear. It's, it's shining, you, you can see clearly even in the dark places exactly what he really left us upon. He proceeded to tell us two things I left with you. The Quran, and I left you with the Sunnah. I left you with the speech of Allah, and I left you with my teachings. The Prophet said, hold on to them with your molar teeth. Not your front teeth, because if you bite something from the front and I pull it off, it, it's not a strong grip, it comes out. But if you bite something with these teeth right in the back, when you hold on to it, that grip is so tough, it stays, it remains, and nothing is taken out away. The Prophet said, hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah here, bite hard. Don't let go of it. And if you do that, the Prophet said, you will not be misguided. You will not be upon misguidance. So that's the first two. What's the third thing? Because you know what, brothers and sisters, everyone says, I have the Quran and the Sunnah with me. Everyone's going to come and tell you, you know what, bro, I follow the Quran. They're going to tell you verses. Even these ISIS guys, they're going to pull out verses. They're going to tell you, look, we follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Everyone tells you, I follow Quran and Sunnah. But no, there's another condition. And that condition is that you follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the students of the Prophet, the Sahaba, and their students and their students. Now where am I putting this out? From the clouds? No. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the best of generations is his generation. And then the generation after that. And then the generation after that. So what was the Prophet's generation? Sahaba. What was the generation after that called? The Tabi'een. And the generation after that, the Atba'a Tabi'een. These three generations, we refer to them as the Salaf. The way that we round up this hadith that the Prophet said, and we say it in a simplified way, these three generations, the Salaf. Salaf means those who came before you, the previous early generations. So we have to understand the Quran and the Sunnah, not according to the lenses of these reformers today, or you and I, or your Shaykh, or my Shaykh, but according to the understanding of Umar ibn Khattab. According to the understanding of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Abdullah ibn Abbas and their students who sat with them and took the Qur'an from them word for word. Mujahid rahimullah, the student of Ibn Abbas who said, I read the Qur'an upon Ibn Abbas three times and every place I stopped and I asked him, what does this mean? What does this mean? These are the people who we need their understanding. What did they take from it? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Qur'an, he affirmed of this. He said, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدِهْتَدَى Allah said, oh Muhammad, if these people are upon what you believe. No, he didn't say what you believe. Amanta, amantum. He said, Muhammad, if they're upon what you all believe. Allah made it plural. Because if Allah was saying, oh Muhammad, if Allah just wanted to say, Muhammad, follow the, let them follow you. Then Allah would have said, if they're upon, amanta, what you believe. No. Allah said, amantum. Because who was with the Prophet at the time? His students. The Sahaba, Allah said, if they are upon what you and your companions believe, فَقَدِهْتَدَى They are upon guidance. So if we follow the Sahaba and then the Hadith of the Prophet adds the other two generations, the students of the Sahaba and their students, then inshaAllah ta'ala, we're going to be upon guidance. But then Allah said, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ If they turn away from what you and your, stu your students are upon amantum, those who are with you, your Sahaba Muhammad. So it's not for you to say, oh, I follow the Prophet. Allah said, for you and the Sahaba, if they turn away from what you two are upon, you and your companions, فَإِنَّمَا هُمْ فِي شِقَاقٍ 
they are in opposition to you. They are in dissension. They're on a different level, on a different wavelength. Brothers and sisters, we have to return back to the understanding of the Salaf. Then you won't have these problems like ISIS and all these problems, whatever other problems, these other groups and sects and whatever there is. The Muslims will be able to come to unity. Now the fourth thing, the fourth thing that we need to come with that will give us success inshallah ta'ala. We've come with the Quran and the Sunnah, good. We came with the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the Salaf, good. What do we do? What's number four? We unite. Unite upon what? The Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the Salaf. Brothers and sisters, is uniting in and within itself praiseworthy? No, it's not. Is it praiseworthy for me to reunite with people who are misguided? For me to hold hands with misguided people and say, no, 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 we need to be united this day and age? Is it praiseworthy for us to be united with, our, with the likes of people who insult our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha? Who, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you your, that Aisha is your mom. Your mom told you she's your mom and that's why you believe that, right? Allah told you Aisha is your mom radiallahu ta'ala anha. And you want me to unite with people and hold hands with them who are, who, who are calling her a fornicatress? You want me to unite with people who are insulting Abu Bakr and Umar? You want me to unite with people who are worshipping graves? You want me to unite with people who are walking around with tatweezes, magic, and think that this is going to cure them? You want me to unite with people who are parts of these different groups and sects and like, like, like you want me to unite? Like, well, like, come on, man. Every single person, every single person has their own agenda. Everyone's going in their own opposite directions. How is that called unity? How is that called unity? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He told us to unite, He said, وَأْتَصِمُوا بِحَبِ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا Allah, when He said unite, He didn't say unite, or Muslims. He said unite upon the rope of Allah. The rope of Allah is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The Qur'an and the Sunnah is what you unite upon. It's not that me, I come with this brother and that brother and I hold hands, no. It's that I go to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and then I find all the other brothers coming to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And what I'm holding onto is the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but we're all together when we're doing this. Brothers and sisters, unity upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah, according to the understanding of the Salaf, is what is praiseworthy for us. And that is what we need to come back to. And wallahi, when we do come back to this, so th th for a second, let me focus, let me hammer this point in. Wallahi, it's not unity. Who can stand on a stage with a brother from Hizb al-Tahrir, and a brother from this organization, and a brother from this jama'ah, and a brother from this group, and you can have this imam from this sect and this firqa, and you can call, oh, Muslims are united. Wallahi, you're, you're, you're not united. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the Yahud, the Banu Israel, they were like this. Allah said, from the outside, you think that they're united. قلوبهم شتى But their hearts are disunited. From the outside, you think that they're united. But inside, they're all in different wavelengths. And that's what all these Muslims are like nowadays. And Wallah is not going to do nothing anytime soon. Unity is nothing. And that's what? وَأْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Unless it's upon the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who understood that wrote better than the Salaf? So come back to their understanding. And brothers and sisters, Wallahi, when you have everything in place, Quran, Sunnah, Salaf, when you have that, and then the unity comes, Wallahi, it's a victory for you. Because Ibn al-Qayyim, Rahimullah, in his book, Furusuyatul Muhammadiyah, he brings the ayah from Surah Al-Anfal, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and what's amazing about this ayah is that he chapters it, he calls it the, 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 the dome of victory. He says, this ayah is the dome of victory. It encompasses everything that we need in order to have victory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa says, Obey Allah and His Messenger. And don't become disunited. Don't become disunited. And be patient. Allah is with those who are patient. Ibn al-Qayyim says here, notice that if you fall into what? Disunity. What you have done is effectively to those enemies of yours, you have given them what? You have given them an army against you. You have given them an army to fight against you with. There's no victory for you. Wallahi brothers and sisters, this religion has a huge emphasis, huge emphasis on unity. And there you have brothers who are trying to break the back of the Muslims. Every little single problem they can find a nitpick, they try to do it to divide the Muslims under the banner of Islam, but then you have the other extreme. People are saying, brother, put aside our differences. You can insult Aisha and Abu Bakr and I love them, it's okay. And you go here and you worship a grave and let's all hold hands. And the religions are separate in opposite directions.
It makes no sense. Brothers and sisters, let me summarize one more time. The Prophet ﷺ told us about our affair. He mentioned the hadith to us which describes our situation. Wallahi, he told us the reason is because we love this dunya and we hate the next life. We need to come back to our religion. The Prophet told us that Allah will lift, uplift this humiliation from us. The religion is the Quran and the Sunnah. Who's understanding though? The Salaf. We gave evidences. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 137. And then we unite upon that understanding. And then brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uplift this humiliation. If you're concerned about that little boy and the little girl and the innocent people who are going to get bombed in Syria, if you're concerned about their well-being, don't go sign no more petitions. Why right, petitions is not the answer, don't you understand? If petitions was an answer, don't you think the Prophet would have told us? Why are you protesting? Well, like, if protesting, could the Prophet have protested if he wanted to? Yes, he could have. If he could have, then why didn't he? Because he didn't see a benefit in it. But what did the Prophet see a benefit in, brothers and sisters? The Prophet saw a benefit in learning the Qur'an, learning the Sunnah, and then uniting upon this, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So brothers and sisters, please come back to that. And I leave you with a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in which he said in Bukhari, that in times of haraj, bloodshed, in times of bloodshed, the Prophet said, worshipping, praying to raka'at, worship, sorry, worshipping at that time, worshipping Allah at that time, is the equivalent of making Hijrah to the Prophet ﷺ. Hijrah is you leaving behind all your family, all your businesses and friends, and you go just to be with the Prophet ﷺ, just to be with him. The Prophet said, worshipping in times of bloodshed is like you make Hijrah to me. Why? Because brothers and sisters, in times of bloodshed, everyone's concerned with politics. They're on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, and they miss their prayers. They don't do their prayers properly. Brothers and sisters, in these times, worship is the solution. Come back to Allah. But worship Allah from the Quran, Sunnah, according to the understanding of the Salaf, and be united upon that. The final thing that I tell you, brothers and sisters, and Wallahi, I only say this to you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you can't do these things, you can't come back to the Quran and the Sunnah unless you study the religion. And Wallahi, ignorance is what makes you confused. Like I mentioned in the previous video, the Prophet said, Fa'tazil firqa, leave off every, uh, every, 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 every group. Leave off every hizb. In fact, Allah crystal clearly in the Quran says, leave off every hizb. And then you got people going around saying, asking me in the comments, brother, does that mean hizb or tahrir is wrong? I don't care with how many evidences they bring you in a fancy type of way. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to make a video in detail about hizb or tahrir, clarifying the matter. But when I'm telling you that they call themselves hizb or tahrir, hizb is in there. And Allah told you in the Quran, don't come with that hizbiyah. And they tell you we're hizb. And you're telling me, is it permissible? I don't, well, I don't even know how to question that, that question and all. Just the fact that you see an ayah like that. Allah says, stay away from making yourself into hizbs. And then you got a group called Hizb, hizb al-Tahrir and you try to justify it. And tell me, no, it's not Hizb. I, I don't know. Well, I'm confused. How about Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah? That's our name. The Prophet gave us that name. That's it. We leave it there. But well, you won't know this stuff until you study. So I urge you, please, go study your religion. Learn the Arabic language. Study your religion. And if you can't, at the very least, then there's many things online for you to do. I mentioned to you many times, we have the Muslim Survival Guide. Wallahi, we only made this. We only made this program. So it can be a means of you learning the most obligatory things that you need to know. In my years of, my very small time in the Dawah, I've seen a lot of madness. And the one thing that I've seen is people don't know basics. Wallahi, you're asking me, Quran, Sunnah, what is basic? They don't know how to pray. Wallahi, you can study this stuff. We brought it all for you online, inshallah ta'ala. So if you go to muslimsurvivalguide.com and you're serious about studying religion and it's difficult for you to go to the masjid and find an imam who's upon the methodology of the self and really teach you properly, then at least online, these little 10, 15 minute videos every week that are going to come your way. So go muslimsurvivalguide.com, register and learn your religion, please. Okay, so click the subscribe button if you haven't already. Share the video, like the video, inshallah. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.